Ladies and, well, ladies, we're talking business. Ladies' business. No, not that ladies' business. Ladies in business. Especially trading business. Whether you're a CEO, self employed, working for someone, or supporting someone else in theirs, this is a podcast about ladies in tradie businesses. Join your host, Nick Cox, one half of Tradies in Business and the Tradiepreneur Program, as she interviews inspirational, everyday, motivational and extraordinary women from all industries and walks of life about what it takes to be a truly successful, modern lady in business. Hello, ladies in business. How are you? We're recording this on a Wednesday, middle of the week. I'm so excited. Easter is just around the corner. And I am joined by a wonderful guest today, Mel Brown. Mel is a financial wellness advocate, a coach, a financial coach, a sometimes therapist. Oh, yeah, I hear you there. Very much the same (laughs) for me. Um, An educator, a speaker, advisor, and a multiple business owner. Her passion is to help women particularly move from where they are now to a place that they didn't even believe was possible. I'm so excited to hear about that to become financially empowered and financially well in their business finances and their businesses, to have courageous conversations, love that, whether it's about finances, money, businesses, or one of the many other things that we're all avoiding in life. Mel is also a best-selling author. The books are brilliant. We'll get to that in a minute, I'm sure. With her most recent book title, Budgets Don't Work, but this does. Welcome, Mel. Thank you so much for joining me today. No worries. Thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure. I am really pumped to dig into our topic today. We're going to talk a lot about money. And I guess, as we were saying before we went live to air, I don't think taboo is the right word, but we don't mm. talk about it enough. It's still one of those areas where I think, particularly as women, we are Um, maybe not as empowered as we need to be to be having these conversations and getting the learnings that we need. I see a very different shift in the next generation coming through. I have a 26 year old Mm. daughter who is on it in a way I had never even thought about at her age. She's incredibly financially intelligent, but I think for the most part, particularly as business owners as well, it's just one of those areas that we don't perhaps talk openly enough about so that we can seek the information that we don't know that we need. Yeah. Look, I completely agree. Uh, There was definitely a taboo around money. It was kind of sex, money, politics and religion. They're just not polite dinner conversation. And sex we're kind of okay with now. Politics, I still want to argue in religion is a bit taboo. Uh, We're happy to talk about our spirituality, but religion is off the table. Mm -hmm. Um, But money definitely is uh, one that I see. And it's interesting, as you say, younger women seem to be talking about it more. But even then I see gaps in how they're thinking and talking about it. And if I can really highlight the problem, you know, the latest Hilda report came out, the household um, and labour report, and it said that 48% of women had a poor financial literacy. So more than half of us have poor financial literacy at a time when we really need to have better financial literacy because, I mean, COVID rocked us. Mm. Uh, women are over 55 are most at risk of homelessness. Mm. You know, there's 450,000 women in their 40s at risk of homelessness. So we really need to care and give a shit about money. We absolutely do. And that, I find that absolutely mind-blowing, even though I understand that it's quite an unspoken topic. We don't talk about it at all, if enough. I mean, even in our coaching program, we, we struggle to – have those conversations around money because there's so much fear. It's a big requirement mm-hmm. of the program. We're going to be looking at your finances. We're going to be helping you make plans. I'm sure you do very much the same. But opening those conversations can be super challenging, I yeah. guess, because of fear of judgment and fear of not enoughness and fear of what are the Joneses next door doing or not doing mm-hmm. and how am I comparing? Do and what do those that? numbers say about me? Yes, so true. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm an ex-accountant and an ex-financial advisor. So I'm just used to, uh, for me, numbers are just numbers in the same way that words are just words. Like they really are. They don't mean anything. Mm. Um, And I used to be fascinated. I remember going, I was part of a a group that met for dinner every single month, uh, the little black dress group. And it was asked at the table, so what's your goals this year? And at that time I said, well, it was quite a number of years ago. I said, well, my goal is for my uh, profit in my business to be a million bucks and a few of the women looked at me like oh 
And a couple of them came up to me after and said, oh, that was very brave. Like, really? Wow. <laughs> How is it brave? We're just talking the actual substantiated numbers rather than that vague. And I'm sure you get this a lot. Yeah. Oh, you know, I just want to do well or I just yes. want to increase or even I, I want my business to do 20% better. That's awesome. What does that mean? Like, give me the hard numbers. Um, but it is, I, th- I think there is something around nice girls don't talk about it and they certainly don't say they want more of it. Mm. Uh, it's unfeminine. It's not nice. And that's something I really think we need to push aside and say if we want to uh, give back, we need money for that. If we want to uh, help ourselves financially, if we want to help our family, it, then we need to put our financial oxygen masks on and that involves actually understanding the numbers. I I really struggle with something I see. Look, it's everywhere and it's the perhaps it comes back to that comparison and the tall poppy mm. syndrome very much that's yes. extremely strong in Australia. And if we happen to say I want more or I'm working towards more, that feels th- or can potentially feel so threatening to many around us that mm. I think it's really put a cap on some of those conversations. Exactly if you've just highlighted there with the $1 million profit, what's wrong with being brave and being okay to speak about what we're working for and what we'd like to achieve, yeah. particularly when, well, I don't think there's any conditions. And I'd like to say for many of us, we are mothers and we are leaders within our families and we are business owners and that should very much be on our radar because money might not buy happiness, but it does solve an awful lot of problems and oh, gives yeah. an awful lot of choice. <laughs> exactly. We have to understand it to get there. It is. And it's understanding those money stories uh, that we grew up with. And we spend, uh, I've got a course at uh, a financial donning plan. And the reason we spend the first two weeks on that is because, yes, it's really easy to put a financial plan together to understand investing. I mean, I say that because I think it is. It's just a learned process. Yes. But some of the hardest stuff is the why aren't we talking about it? Why are we behaving this way? And some of that has got to do with those messages that we picked up. Mm. Things like nice girls don't do that or that's greedy or no, you, you can't push yourself forward or make sure you share and there's got to be enough to go around. So all these messages we've picked up as kids We've somehow absorbed that into our finances where you're right. We think that there's not enough to go around. What does it say about me if I was to say that? Like, does that mean that I'm greedy or not nice or a bad person? Where where actually, uh, who are we not to say that we want more? Uh, when it went with, with women, uh, I hear the words just and only used all the time with business and finances. Oh, I'm just saving for this. Or it's just a little holiday or, oh, this was just on sale or it's just a home-based business. If I could strip two words from our language, it would be those two. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and I think that alone would help us financially. So if you've, I'd love uh, people listening, if you hear yourself do that or if you know someone do it or if you hear someone else say it start to call each other out with that yeah I love that idea Mel where do you think um some of that deep-seated fear comes from is it quite simply Mm. the way we've been brought up as children and what we're modeling from our own family life or is it coming externally as we go through those really impressionable teenage years uh, and there's a lot of, I certainly for my generation, there was a lot of stigma around money. There was a lot of, mm. there weren't conversations. You'd read fantastic magazines and even there it wasn't really being highlighted. And if it was, it was controversial. So yeah. it, is it a combination of everything or is it is there something even deeper at play here? Look, for women, I think we're caught in this perfect storm. Um, part of it is that whole nice nice girl and we're taught as a young as young girls to be nice girls and to play nicely and to be ladylike and to not push yourself forward you know if we're assertive we're called bossy if we're um, putting ourselves forward we're aggressive and we're, that's all seen as seen as bad things uh, so it's rewriting a lot of that but also the media uh, has a lot to answer for so there was Starling Bank Research, uh, which is a bank in the UK, where they discovered that the media talk to men and women very differently when it comes to finances. So for men, it's about power um, and how money makes you more of a man, which is also not a great message. But to women, 
60, over 68% of messages were that we overspend. Mm. Um, and over 90% of articles uh, written about money for women were how we need to be more frugal. Yes. So we're constantly told to be less than and to reduce from the time that we're young through to the media and every day, you know, just, oh, you're being too loud. Just, you know, just be quiet. And we take that into our finances. Mm. And I also think there's a glass ceiling where I think, <laughs> I think no one judges a woman harder sometimes than other women. And we need to, you know, I was to, I've been talking about super and career breaks recently. And I've been told things you, like you need to stay in your lane. Um, and do you have kids? How can you be talking about that? I'm like, really? You know, how about we, and, and I know that's come from women who have been judged. So they're kind of striking out first. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that there's so much judgment around women, but I think we're our worst enemies sometimes for that. And we need to start to understand why are we acting that way? Why are we, why is our first response to go, oh, no, that's not okay. Or we can't do that. Or I can't do that. What's behind that? And then how can we we rewrite that? Uh, Because uh, when it comes to business, we should be as on par with the blokes. Mm. We're starting businesses faster than ever. And yet we're not. Mm. And often that, you know, that could come down to pricing, where women, if we're valuing ourselves and we don't value ourselves, then we're not going to price appropriately. So I see all of this not enough and playing it small played out so throughout our personal finances and our businesses. And I see it so problematic. Like there's so much rewriting and redoing that needs to be done. It's so incredibly true. Thank goodness we have brave people like you, Mel, that are happy to stand up and talk and I guess shine a spotlight onto the issue. So because I find it absolutely phenomenal to think of the statistics you were talking about in the beginning of the episode mm. of women who aren't financially literate or are, are on the brink of homelessness or at risk of homelessness. I was really fortunate to have strong female role models in my life that taught me a lot of these lessons very early on. So I've never... Um, found myself in a position where I didn't understand, I guess, what was going on with our income, whether it be the business income or our personal income. I do, however, I don't talk about my money. I don't talk about what opportunities that might afford me or the mistakes I might have made. I don't talk about any of those things. And I guess then I'm just contributing to the same thing that everybody else is because I let the stereotypes wash over me rather than actually yeah. pull them out where they are I don't I just on the weekend I was at the markets we came back we didn't buy anything the parking guy volunteer lovely man made a joke about how lucky a husband my husband was because I hadn't spent any money oh my god I couldn't believe it uh-huh and if That's the truth were known liminal things we're getting all the time absolutely yep. yeah and we just yep. don't call it out and I probably wouldn't have in his situation because the conversation mm. is then too yeah. big Exactly. But it's a great, I guess, example of how every day these messages are very much a part of who we are and our own belief system. And that's got to be really challenging, Mel. You, In working with finances and helping women to become more literate about what they're doing with their finances and the potential of what money can do for them and their family, mm. you're having to deal with some really personal stuff, some big beliefs that they have about themselves and their businesses. How did you find yourself in that space? <laughs> well, I, interestingly, it was because I, w- I was dealing with so many business owners. So I owned an accounting firm for almost 20 years and a financial planning firm as well. And what we discovered really quickly, uh, the team and I, were that you would be talking about uh, the business and how it was performing or you'd be talking about personal finances And really quickly, there would be tissues on the table. (laughs) It would be emotional. (laughs) And you'd be thinking, but I'm just talking numbers here. Why the emotional response? And I quickly realized that it's not about the numbers. It's it's about our reaction to it. And it's about what we think about ourselves and the, the messages that we've had. And I used to see these patterns like with creative people where they would just say, oh, I, I'm just no good at the numbers. I'll never be good at the numbers. And it's almost that's what they've been told from the minute they hit school. Oh, you're creative. You're not good at maths. So therefore, they bring that into their business. 
And it's just an assumption. Mm. I'm creative, therefore I'm not good at. And when you start to break that and they start to realise not only do they know the numbers, but they can be creative about numbers and about the results that they choose to have, it's mind-blowing to them. Um, And it's just, for me, about thinking about it in a different way for people and realising that often why we don't think that we're great with numbers or we don't think we're great with finances is because we've thought we've had to behave a particular way or that it's had to look a particular way because of the one-size-fits-all approach that we often give to that, whereas actually it's about figuring out what's right for me and the approach that will be right for me and then running with that. Mm, I love that. I, You've just shone a light bulb for me. Thank you very much. I was never good at maths. It was not my strong mm. suit. Mm-hmm. I didn't enjoy it. And even when I think about the way it was taught, it was very masculine. Yeah. So no wonder I did not enjoy the lessons. We were always talking about little Johnny in our equations <laughs> rather than little Sammy or little Nicole. Um, so it's the whole system has always been geared for me to feel less than because I didn't necessarily understand the complex algebra or I really Mm. didn't care about it, to be honest. I couldn't place value on that during my education. And yet I've always been the budgeter in our, in our households. I've always been um, quite involved with the financial performance of the businesses and monitoring that. We do a lot of it, as I said, um, at Tradies and Business. Mm. So, but I hadn't really connected where maybe some of my own self doubt and my own, even now my, business partner is uh, just like you, an ex-accountant, ex-financial advisor. We let him take care of the money stuff with our training and our Uh our teaching. And it's because I feel less than, just like you've just highlighted. And now you've you've flipped the switch for me. Thank you. Now I understand where it's come from. But interestingly, so I was was naturally good at maths at school in the same way that I'm naturally, I was naturally good with words. And I put that down to, um, I was a left-handed writer and I was swapped Mm. uh, at kindy. I'm that old, Uh, (laughs) (laughs) but I didn't do maths in year 12. Uh, you know, you just be, so I, and I often talk about that and people always give me that same face. (laughs) What? You're an accountant and didn't do maths. All you need for accounting is basic like what a a year six student does is accounting. So if you're helping your kindy, like it's being able to add and and subtract and multiply and tie and divide, that's it. That's as complicated as it gets. And yet we have these biases around, oh, this maths, I can't do it. Absolutely, 100% true. I couldn't agree with you more. And we we see that time and time, like you must with our clients there. There's so much fear around the numbers and so much fear around not being able to do something as simple as a cash flow forecast. Mm-hmm. We They are non-negotiable for business owners in our program Good. so that we can help them understand where they're heading. It's like a crystal ball. There's so much uh-huh. power in numbers. Yep. But to get them over that fear, it can take three to six months to move somebody from that place of fear to the place of understanding because typically we put our heads in the sand. We don't want to think about what's going on. Yeah. We use things like the bank balance to decide whether we can actually pay a bill or make a purchase or mm. any number of decisions that we make around business. Pushing them outside of that fear, though, can be extraordinarily challenging. And I hadn't thought ever to put it together with, okay, where does this fear actually come from? What is guiding that fear? And And sometimes it's language. So you've called something a cash flow forecast. uh, And I talk about four different money types uh, in the work that I do. If you had a creative person, if you had a creator and they heard cash flow forecast, I'd go, Oh God. So if you called it cash flow, um, what was the word you use? Cash flow crystal ball, they'd go, ooh, tell me more about that. And you'd so have them lean in. So I'd encourage you to use different language. Yes. Where you'd say you could call it a cash flow forecast. Or for some of you, I want you to think of this as your cash flow crystal ball, yeah. where you'll be able to see in the future. And I wonder if that will mean that they'll come to it quicker. Yeah, I absolutely love that idea. Look out, listeners. <laughs> it's be really quick. <laughs> but it is where language, uh, we have this presumption of, you know, there are these scary words we use. And if we, why can't we change them and make them something that's more appealing or for some people uh, more palatable mm. and still use that same language for other people? Mm, absolutely. And it's, it's an interesting dynamic because we work with both the couple in the partnership. So we're Mm. working with the men and they tend to have quite strong 
languaging and so cash flow forecast even though they don't like it 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 resonates yeah, uh-huh. with them it's, and it's you're very strong right and let's yeah. go <laughs> let's forecast <laughs> and it's so different for us ladies we we hmm. have a different perspective or we connect to different words so mm. excellent pull up i think we should book this up as a session really with you mel today thank you <laughs> love mel, it tell me a little bit about your program and how you work with women to assist them with their financial literacy yeah, so I used to have a business program uh, and we shut that down last year because we worked out that for me, my passion really is uh, personal finances and women. Um, and if I can teach you about your personal finances, you can take that across to your business finances and start to then realize that, oh, this can translate. And if I can do it here, of course, I can do it across there. Uh, so I've got both master classes, which is shorter and more palatable bite size ways of learning about things like uh, pricing or understanding the numbers or shares or property. Or I've got an eight-week course called the My Financial Adulting Plan where we take you through who you are, which is all the things we talked about, but also where you are now and where you want to go. So we have a financial plan that you have to create that we hold your hand working through so that you put your numbers in, you face the numbers in your personal situation, but then you figure out where you want to go and how you're going to get there. Mm. Um, and then we talk about things like habits that are right for you rather than one size fits all approaches. And then three weeks on investing uh, shares, property and business. So it's that beautiful, well-rounded, uh, everything from debt uh Uh, and investing right back to the simplicity of what bank accounts should I have. And I think that's why it's so powerful because we don't just talk mindset and we don't just give you a seven-step approach. It's that personal approach to Mm. say, well, what works for me? That's fantastic. I think that's probably a big part of the problem is that we have some fantastic systems. I don't want to take credit away from some systems that have been created by others but mm. they're one size fits all, which yeah. is a great place to start perhaps. However, yes. that might not actually work for where you are at and what your particular goals are. I think mm. that needs to be taken into consideration. So that personalised approach is really important to help you mm. get where you want to go instead of putting you on the same track as so many others. There's no point being on the conveyor belt if it's not heading in the right direction. Absolutely. Or uh, if you start a marathon, uh, you want to assess where you are now and what sort of results do you want? And are you just doing it for fun or are you doing it for because you want to win a medal? Mm. Um, have you ever run before? Uh, have you run a, a stack of marathons before but not for a while? Are you carrying injury? Like it's doing all the same thing for your business and your personal finance so that you can curate something that's right for you. Um, And that way you're not going to give up or get injured or get broken by it. So true, so true. Investing shares, property, portfolios, they're big words, they're uncomfortable. I think Mm -hmm. that... Again, just think about to the movies I watched as a teenager. It was never the ladies doing the investing. Yes. We never Mm -hmm. talked about shares. I don't understand a whole bunch about it. I think most women are much the same. Mm. I do see, again, that's another area where I'm seeing change. My daughter, 26, she's playing um, with shares. She's investing quite heavily. Mm. Uh, And a lot of that for her, the education has come externally from school. It wasn't school or uni education. It's been real life education from people like yourself why are we so scared of that and is it is it something that is far simpler to understand than we give it credit for uh it absolutely can be uh so part of the reason why i think is we just don't talk about it Mm -hmm. as we said at the very beginning and shares particularly a lot of in australia particularly we're far more comfortable with property because it's assumed everyone will buy their own home Mm -hmm. so therefore it's talked about on the news it's talked about in our paper like it's everywhere Um, Whereas shares, a lot of people see it as legalised gambling Mm. because we don't understand it. Uh, Whereas I see share investing as a great equaliser and especially thanks to micro investing and apps now, I can invest with one cent. I can invest with Roundup. Um, I can invest with uh, cashback money from when I shop. So it doesn't even have to be my money. Um, Or I can invest from uh, just tiny amounts regularly. So I think it's a great equaliser in that I really don't need a lot of cash to do it. 
And with property, it's also understanding. I think a lot of young people particularly are put off because of the massive deposits that we need now. Um, but for me, it's about education and saying, so if you talk to a broker early, then you can realise what you need to do. Um, you might realise if it's actually worth paying mortgage insurance and having a lower deposit or the things that you need to do in your life in order to get you that loan, such as shutting down buy now, pay later platforms, shutting down credit cards, um, or even being aware of your spending so that you have uh, a beautiful spending and saving history. So that's that whole knowledge is power. But if we're not talking about it, then we don't, we can't then break it down to go, oh, okay. You know, my husband's so into cricket. Mm -hmm. He can just give you stats and numbers and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and he knows that because he's interested in it. Me, mm -hmm. I don't care. But I can tell you shoe designers. I can tell you <laughs> who's, I can walk down High Street and say, uh, so that's a ripoff of Bottega. That's a ripoff of Valentino. That's a ripoff of, uh, you know, Louboutin. Uh, it's because I care about it. Mm. So it's just caring about it in the same way that we would for anything else. Uh, that we're that we're interested in and reading, researching, listening to podcasts and actually starting to learn about it. Again, it's understanding I think that we can do this as women. It's not something yeah. that's strictly for the boys in the boys club. Women have proven so it's and again interesting stats. So there was a, a research piece done in the States where 93% of people surveyed said that women were worse investors. So there is an inherent belief that we don't make great investors. Wow. And yet our Warwick Business School study, uh, a longitudinal study, found that women actually were better investors than men. So both of us performed the index, but women were better investors than men. And I'm not saying that because I don't like to pit the genders. Sure. But we are actually great investors. We just need to give ourselves credit for it. Mm. And often we won't risk the house. Mm. We have a bit of a safety or conservative bent built in, which actually can make us great investors. Yeah, I totally agree. Isn't it interesting how numbers can be used for or against you, uh -huh. regardless of which position you're in? I find that really interesting. I wanted to touch on something that you briefly glossed over a moment ago, and that's buy now, pay later platforms. Mm. And I find... Time and time again, I see a tiny shift again in the market at the moment, but predominantly they're aimed at women yes. and they're aimed at our shopping habits and that shopping culture and we must hide things. You know, again, it's all this negative connotation uh -huh. around money and the way women spend money. Um, I, I think there's a lot that isn't being said about the buy now, pay later platforms and I wondered whether that might be worth a moment just to explore some of the pitfalls, I think, for women in particular yeah. Um, around what that can actually do for you in terms of then being eligible for loans, et cetera, in mm. the future. Because I think in the in the first instance, it was sold as an opportunity to establish a credit history um, because we're all, we all needed credit history to be able to make a big purchase, of course. However, it's not actually that at all. It's quite dangerous. No. And I've been uh, basically when Afterpay first came on the scene, I started talking against them. Mm. Um, and it's, I'm really pleased to see more and more voices uh, join me with that because um, I saw it. So there's a, a psychology of pricing called framing. And as soon as I saw uh, Afterpay released, I thought, I know exactly what you're doing. And it was interesting to see their stats back that up. So First of all, you can't get a great credit history from something like Afterpay because they don't have a credit license. So it doesn't affect that at all. You can get a bad credit history from something like Afterpay if you default and they then have the ability to put that on your credit history. So it's really important to understand that. Afterpay and Buy Now, Pay Later products sell themselves as budgeting apps and being helpful, whereas their own research, if I go to Afterpay's site, they'll... At in their sell to retailers, they say the reason we can charge you more than a credit card and the reason you want us on your site is because your average spend will go up by 40%. Wow. Meaning that you and I will spend 40% more. And the reason that is, is because of the framing effect. So instead of me thinking this purchase is costing me $100, the brain only registers the repayment 
And I have no problem with $25. And I also have no problem increasing 25 to 35. Mm -hmm. Whereas I never would have spent 140 bucks. Mm. Um, And that's the afterpay effect where they're increasing you. They're causing you to spend more. And I call it lube fee spending where we already know digitized payment uh, doesn't uh, light up the insular region in your pain, in your brain. Um, when we used to use cash, it would, you know, the, the orifactory, uh, your senses would light up, you'd mm-hmm. smell the notes, you'd uh, hear the coins, and we would physically feel pain. Mm-hmm. Now, I remember, again, I'm going to show my age. I remember when you had a $50 note in your wallet, you're like, oh, I don't want, I don't want to break that. <laughs> Like we felt pain, yeah. whereas we don't feel that with digit, digitized payments. And, and buy now, pay later takes it one step further. So what we need to do is create the pain. So you can either have an alert on your phone, uh, ping when you spend. Uh, you can do what one of my friends does and he puts stop. So he puts in red on his credit card stop Great. so that when he sees it, that's that register of, oh, hang on, pain. Um, and often the the, uh, the person at the checkout will say to him, are you supposed to be using this? It says, <laughs> so there's like a double win there. Yeah. Um, or you might, like you could pinch yourself. There's some mm-hmm. things that you could do. You could have rules around leaving uh, things in your shopping cart for 24 hours. But just be aware that after paying credit um, and buy now, pay later in credit, will quicken your spending and cause you to overspend. Mm-hmm. And so if you're thinking oh, credit cards are great because I get points or or buy now, pay later is great because it's easy. Uh, Nothing's ever uh, easy. Nothing ever comes without a cost. Mm. And the cost of those points and from the buy now, pay later is that you will spend more. Mm. Brilliant. You've summarised it perfectly. Thank you. Um, Working with trade business owners, and I think small businesses totally, we tend to be really lackluster about investing in our super. Mm. And I thought mm-hmm. today that as a quick wrap up, we should give some understanding around how important super actually is for your mm. financial plan, your wealth plan, for Absolutely. what you want to do with the rest of your life. Um, uh, is that I, something you see? Yes, all the time. So when I was an accountant, uh, so many business owners just felt uh they just felt uncomfortable about super Mm. Um, and they didn't trust it because the government kept changing the rules. So they're like, oh, I don't want to put it into super. And particularly if you don't understand shares, you even felt less uh, like putting it in. And for too many business owners, I saw them view their business as their super, whereas I want you to consider the the sale of your business as the icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. Uh, So my concern for business owners is you're not just losing the super you're contributing, but you're losing the compounding effects of that super. And on my website, we've got a freebie where it's a super calculator. Mm. And if you want to um, feel a little bit sick, I want you to go there and you can put in how what you should have been contributing, how many years you haven't contributed for, how long until retirement, and you can then figure out how much super you've missed out on, but just as importantly, how much you can now contribute in order to catch that up. So for example, if I was earning 70 grand, which means about six and a half grand super, Mm -hmm. if I didn't pay super for myself for four years in my thirties, because I was building a business or having kids or what have you, by the time I retired, that super would be worth $280,000 because of the compounding nature of it. And that's what it's really important to understand. It's not just the four lots of six and a half grand. It's the compound returns that we've lost. So I'm really passionate about people investing in, uh, about business owners contributing to super. And if you're saying to yourself, but I don't need to because I'm a sole trader, I would suggest, and my rule of thumb has always been, if you could go and get a job tomorrow, uh, what wage would you be on? And what super then would be contributed for you? And that's how much as a business owner you should be contributing to super at a minimum. I 
love that. That's a great easy sum to do. Mel, um, absolutely eye-opening. Your statistics, I should not be surprised you would have so many in your kit bag to bring out. <laughs> Being a numbers person. Absolutely. Um, I'm not they're... scared to talk about them. No, I think it's really important. They've really blown me away and opened my eyes and it's time that um, I use the platform to be able to expose more women to some of these statistics and how we can actually make a change. It's never too late. It's not hard to make a change. Yes. Yes, it will take a bit of looking at yourself, a bit of soul searching to push through some of those fear markers. And you can do that, particularly with support of somebody like Mel and her team. Mel, where can our listeners find out more about you? Well, we'll uh, send you a link so that there's uh, so that they can go there. Uh, but you can find me on Instagram at More Money for Shoes. <laughs> given my predilection away right there. Um, or my uh, website's melissabrown.com.au with an E on the end of Brown. Wonderful. We'll make sure we include all of those links in the show notes for you. So just scroll on down, click those, and you can jump all the way through to Mel's website. There is a fantastic landing page there. Please go and have a look. There's some freebies on there for you. Mel, it's been a delight. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. I love that we can perhaps turn on the light bulbs for a few other women while they're listening with us today. No, I love that. Thank you for inviting me and having these conversations about money. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another episode of Ladies in Business. Got a guest you'd like us to interview? Maybe you have a story to share or some feedback to give. Find us on socials or drop us a message via the Tradies in Business website. Take care of yourself, ladies.